would request uh, Dr. Roni Abaja, and uh, Roni is a uh, well known, you heard him talking, and uh, he's going to talk about the endophytic tumor. So, just before I start, uh, I just want to get a poll of the audience, if I may. Uh, how many people here have done a robotic partial nephrectomy already? By show of hands. So, we have a good number. And then, how many people are predominantly doing open partial nephrectomy? And how many predominantly laparoscopic partial nephrectomy? Less, less folks. Okay, good. Well, that just helps. So we've seen a beautiful example of a uh, partial nephrectomy by Dr. Gill today, uh, and we've seen uh, now a couple good talks giving uh, a lot of uh, details regarding how to do partial nephrectomies robotically and what some of the advantages are. The topic that I have is uh, specifically to talk about endophytic tumors. And uh, these are ones, uh, just from personal experience, uh, from starting out with laparoscopic partial nephrectomy, the endophytic tumors were ones that would make me nervous. And uh, I did certainly feel limited laparoscopically in terms of uh, attacking these tumors. And uh, robotically really have, uh, with uh, time, become very comfortable doing these. So uh, there's uh, endophytic tumors like these, uh, which you've seen before. And then uh, there are the completely endophytic tumors, which I think are uh, really much more challenging. So endophytic is bad, but when they're completely endophytic, I think it really is a greater level of difficulty. Uh, and so I have some recommendations for treating these endophytic tumors, but you can really take some of these uh, recommendations to uh, even non-endophytic tumors, just the first tumors that you do robotically. So these are kind of basic recommendations. Uh, I think uh, these are recommendations I would make to anyone regardless of their experience when they're doing completely endophytic tumors, but I would make these arguments even for somebody who's doing an easier tumor, but it's just earlier in their learning curve. So these are the three things that I'm going to talk about uh, for doing endophytic tumors. Number one is achieving a bloodless field. Number two, laparoscopic ultrasound and doing your homework ahead of time. Why a bloodless field? Why, why do I recommend a bloodless field when doing completely endophytic tumors? Well, it's already very easy to get lost when you're doing a partial nephrectomy. Uh, but it's that much easier to get lost when you're doing a completely endophytic tumor. You don't have any external cues of the tumor's location. You're purely relying on your uh, ultrasound uh, evaluation and your preoperative imaging to know where the tumor is. So if you have uh, a very bloody field as you're doing that, you can get in trouble much more easily than if you have a bloodless field. So for me, when I do a completely endophytic tumor, I insist on having a bloodless field. Uh, now, that's debatable. Somebody, somebody else may say, well, do it, you know, without ischemia and, and whatnot. But for me, again, this is just my recommendation, is to do it with a bloodless field. Uh, also, I recommend cutting with cold scissors. I think we've seen uh, that from uh, multiple people today from the live case as well as uh, video clips. Cutting with cold scissors as opposed to using, for example, harmonic scalpel, ligature, or even just using a lot of monopolar cautery. Uh, and I'll say why here in a second. And then lastly, uh, again, uh, we can argue whether to do off-clamp for these tumors uh, or even selective clamping, uh, but we have to keep our priorities straight. And the priority when doing these resections is to make sure that you get the tumor out with a negative margin, you don't accidentally cut into the tumor because you get lost, uh, and in addition to that, try to save as much normal kidney as possible and not waste a lot of kidney because you get lost and you end up going wider than you need to. So this is why uh, I recommend cutting with cold scissors rather than with cautery. Uh, this is just an example, but obviously, you know, th this can happen anytime. But this was a tumor where I was cutting along. This is the deep margin of the tumor. And as I'm cutting along, I started getting very close to the pseudocapsule. And I said, I want a little bit more margin here. So I backed up, and I went a little bit wider, and I gave myself an extra millimeter of parenchyma. This is something that I wouldn't have been able to see if it had all been cautery. If it's all cautery, you can't tell the difference between tumor and normal kidney. But if you cut with cold scissors, you can see this, and you can get as much margin as you want. If you want one millimeter, you can get one millimeter. If you want five millimeters, you get five millimeters. If you want to enucleate, you can enucleate. But if you do it all with cautery, it's very hard to tell where you are in the kidney. So bloodless field, how do we achieve a bloodless field? Well, it's rather obvious, but sometimes not so obvious. Uh, obviously, you have to find all the arteries. Uh, if you're in doubt, then clamp all the arteries. So in other words, you can do selective artery clamping. Uh, if you have more than one artery, you can try to figure out which artery is it that's supplying the area of the tumor. But again, for a completely endophytic tumor, my recommendation is 
make sure that you get all the blood supply to that kidney because if you start cutting into the tumor and you realize that you're in a watershed area and the artery that you clamped or the branch that you clamped is not the one that was feeding that area where the tumor is, uh, again, it gets very bloody very quickly and you can get lost very easily. So usually it's easy to find all the arteries and clamp them, uh, but sometimes you don't, and that's when you get into trouble. So how can you make sure? Well, if you're on the left side, one way to be sure is to work right on the aorta. So on the left side, uh, you have much more room and you can work right on the aorta as you see here, so you can make sure that you get the right artery. And one thing that should make you suspicious, as Dr. Gill was suspicious earlier today, if the artery looks too small, don't believe it. If it's a small artery, don't believe that that's the only artery. I don't care what your CT scan or your MRI showed. Make sure that there aren't other arteries when you're doing a completely endophytic tumor. If it's an exophytic tumor and it's an easy chip shot tumor, then you might be able to get away with it. It may turn out that you had the wrong artery and you'll get away with it. It's like doing it off clamp. But if you have a completely endophytic tumor and you make that mistake, it can turn into a nightmare. So on the right side, uh, uh, you can do the same thing. It's a little bit more difficult on the right side to work right on the aorta, but you can go interaortal cavel. Uh, and this is just an example from my experience. Uh, here's the tumor here. And on the, on the scan, I thought that the patient had two renal arteries coming off of the aorta. Uh, but what I found was a little bit different. So here's the uh, kidney. And again, you can't see the tumor because it's completely endophytic. But what we found was actually that there were three arteries. So here I insisted on going into aortal cable, working right on the aorta, because I wanted to make sure that I got the blood supply to this kidney completely controlled. It's a mid-pole tumor. It's completely endophytic. So I want to get complete control of these, what turned out to be three arteries, in the inter aortal cable space. This is also a good technique if you have an early branching artery. So if you have an artery that branches behind the cava, then just control an inter aortal cable before it branches rather than trying to find three or four branches. So now you can see we have a completely bloodless field to resect this completely endophytic tumor. And that's, again, what I recommend to do these. Moving on to laparoscopic ultrasound, in my opinion, the laparoscopic ultrasound is 100% necessary for doing these. Uh, and some people will do laparoscopic or robotic partial nephrectomy without using the laparoscopic ultrasound. Some people don't have it in their hospital. Uh, in my opinion, I think it's necessary, so I never do it without using the ultrasound. Uh, but particularly, obviously, for the endophytic tumors, the ultrasound is 100% necessary. And the reason why, uh, even for the, for the non-endophytic, is that, uh, in my opinion, it's not just about uh, getting a negative margin. It's also about minimizing the amount of kidney that we waste. Uh, and obviously, kidney that we resect is not functional kidney. So we can argue about 15 versus 20 versus 30 minutes of warm ischemia, but the kidney that you cut out is gone. It's never going to work, regardless of how quick your ischemia time was or whether you did it off clamp. So really, we should be trying not only to get a negative margin, but also trying to do it with wasting as little normal kidney as possible. So really, it's beautiful robotically that we can tailor our margins. If we want two or three millimeters of margin, we can do that. Uh, here's a, a more endophytic tumor, and you can see that we can get uh, a very tight margin without wasting a lot of normal kidney. And actually, uh, usually when we do partial nephrectomies, we like small tumors. Uh, with completely endophytic tumors, smaller is actually not better. It's actually a little bit easier when the tumor is larger. Uh, when the tumor is very small, like 1 centimeter or 1.5 centimeters, and it's completely endophytic, it's actually harder to save normal kidney. You end up, I think, wasting more kidney than you need to when it's a smaller tumor as opposed to when it's a larger tumor. And these are just some examples of that. Again, trying to tailor the resection. Now, obviously, you could have started much wider and wasted a lot of kidney. But again, we want to try to minimize the amount of normal kidney that we waste. This is a post-cryo failure. So this patient had a cryo three years ago and had a recurrence. And that one was a very difficult one to find. So uh, how can we use the ultrasound to spare more kidney? Well, there's a few things that we can use the ultrasound for. It's not so simple as just finding the tumor. That's step one. So the ultrasound, yes, we use it to find the tumor. That's step one, but that's not the whole story. There's much more to it than that. Uh, the ultrasound also helps us find where the edges of the tumor are. So we should use the ultrasound to find the tumor and then find where we think the edges of the tumor are. But again, it doesn't stop there. Because yes, we can use the ultrasound this way. We can sweep along the kidney and find that, oh, here's the edge. Uh, so we see tumor, tumor, tumor. We get here, there's no tumor. OK, so we can mark the kidney and we can cut here. And we can cut here. But then we end up wasting a lot more kidney when we do that. Here's just an example that I showed earlier. Here's a completely endophytic tumor. 
So from the outside, we didn't know where this tumor was. We used the ultrasound, and you can see we probably could have done a little bit better job. This is not a huge amount of kidney that we wasted, but we probably could have done a little bit better job had we kind of followed the contour of the tumor a little bit more. We may have been able to save a little bit more kidney. Would it have made a difference to the renal function? Probably not. But how can we use the ultrasound to do more than just find the edges? Well, uh, first of all, again, you can sweep along the tumor, but also you want to rotate the probe so that you can figure out where to cut. So it's not just sweeping on the kidney, it's also rotating the probe. I hope this makes sense. These are not great pictures. I made them myself. I apologize. But basically the idea here is that not just to sweep along the kidney with the ultrasound and figure out where the tumor ends inside the kidney, but also to angulate the probe so that you can figure out which direction to cut. So obviously we're not going to cut this way. We could cut this way, but we can save more kidney if we cut this way. And when you combine those factors, you can then do a much more contoured resection. Again, with sweeping and rotating, you can figure out exactly where to cut so that instead of cutting way out here and wasting some kidney, you can do, again, a much more tailored approach and save more kidney. And again, is this a lot of kidney to waste? No, it's not, but this is just an example, of course. Uh, it gets much worse, and so you want to save as much as you can. So here's an example intraoperatively. So the tile pro is showing us the ultrasound view here, so the surgeon sees both. And here is a completely endophytic tumor. We don't see where it is. But rather than just sweeping along the kidney, you can see here how we're rotating the probe. So you can't see the tumor very well here. But basically what I'm trying to figure out is where is it that I just barely lose the tumor edge when I rotate so that I know the direction. And here I'm pointing for myself that I'm going to cut here and I'm going to cut there. So I'm mentally making a picture in my head as to not just where I'm going to cut, which I can mark on the capsule, but also the direction that I'm going to cut. So again, I can contour the tumor and waste as little kidney as possible. And that's true not only for completely endophytic tumors, but really for any tumor that has an endophytic component. So here's an example of a complex cystic tumor that has a completely endophytic component here. And this is a cyst, so obviously if we cut into the cyst, that's bad. It's going to leak. And if, it's, if it is malignant, you're going to have cancer cells all over the place. So here's a situation where we could take a very wide resection to get this part of the cyst out, but we want to tailor it as much as possible, and the ultrasound allows us to do that. And then lastly, do your homework. What do I mean by doing your homework? Well, uh, with endophytic tumors, there's less room for error, so you don't want to take any shortcuts. Again, you can take shortcuts when you do partial nephrectomies, and most of the time you'll get away with it. But there's less room for error on endophytic tumors, and so you should really take the time and make sure you set things up before you start. So before I put the clamp on and start cutting the kidney, I want to be 100% sure that I've optimized the situation. How is the kidney facing me? Have I cleaned enough fat off? Have I really ultrasounded well enough to understand where this tumor is? Those are the types of things that we need to do before we start cutting. So here's an example of that. This is a right upper pole posterior tumor. So here's the right upper pole, and you see this endophytic tumor. It's medial, it's upper pole, it's on the right. And this is probably, in my opinion, the worst location for a tumor if you're going transperitoneal. But I still go transperitoneal. I, Alok is going to give a talk next about why we don't need retroperitoneal surgery. I agree with him. I do all of mine transperitoneal. And even for this one, which is a bad location, transperitoneal, uh, we can get to it. You just have to do your homework and make sure that you set it up ahead of time. So uh, here's an example of that. Uh, this is the video for that tumor. So again, it's an upper pole. So the ultrasound is used to find the tumor. It's on the back side. So we're looking through the kidney, and you can see it on the back side. And this, we have a Doppler laparoscopic ultrasound probe, which is more expensive. But really, I love it, and it's, it's very helpful. So here we're doing a selective artery clamping. So we find the branch of the artery uh, that's leading to this. Uh, it's the posterior segmental artery. So then we flip the kidney over, but we've done our homework. We've completely mobilized the kidney. We've cleaned the fat off of where the tumor is. We've marked the kidney with cautery on the capsule so I know where to cut. And in this case, this is one of the rare times that I use the fourth arm to hold the kidney in place for me with the kidney flipped so that I can do this resection. And again, you can see here, we can't really tell where the tumor is, uh, but we can do this resection because we've done our homework and we can do it safely uh, and get the tumor out uh, and then reconstruct the, the renal bed. So this is a, a patient who has a 9.3 centimeter uh, renal mass, as you can see here. It's an upper pole tumor, but it's large enough that it's turned the kidney. So the kidney was actually turned horizontally. Uh, so you see here, this is an upper pole tumor. And we could see on the scan that there was actually a vein thrombus in the main renal vein. So this is, again, just a, an MRI uh, picture. So basically, this is what we have preoperatively. We have an upper pole renal tumor. Uh, we know we have to do a heminephrectomy here. But the tumor is into the renal vein. There's two major branches of the renal vein. 
and it goes through the upper pole branch and into the main renal vein. So uh, basically what I said to myself is, if we can resect this, uh, why not? What we'll have to do though is we're going to have to maintain drainage of this lower pole salvage portion. So what we'll have to do is we'll have to reconstruct the vein once we have excised uh, the tumor thrombus from the lumen. So this is what the video looks like. This is a very abridged version, of course. But uh, this is the upper pole tumor here. So we saved the vein as the very last. So we've completely mobilized the tumor and resected it. And then here's opening the renal vein. Obviously, the vein is clamped. And then we resect the edge of the vein. Now, we can't just transect the vein because this has to drain the lower pole of the kidney that we're going to salvage. There's no other vein to drain this kidney. So here's the final specimen. Here's the tumor thrombus. So upper pole hemianephrectomy, essentially. There's the tumor thrombus that we extracted from the vein. And now we close the vein with proline suture. And then once we close the vein, uh, we then reconstructed the renal bed and then unclamped. Here's the unclamping at the end. And then this is what we've salvaged. So here's the lower half of the kidney now has been salvaged, despite the fact that there was a vein thrombus. And here's the ultrasound with the Doppler to show that we have good flow in, good flow out. We've saved this half of the kidney. So this was the specimen. So again, upper pole hemianephrectomy. Here's the parenchymal edge. Here's the sinus fat. And then here's the vein with the tumor thrombus. Here's the patient preoperatively. So here was the tumor. Here's the tumor thrombus. And then postoperatively, here's the lower pole hemianephrectomy that we saved. And then this is just, again, preoperative, postoperative. This is six months postoperative. And you can see that we saved about half of that kidney. So again, it's just to illustrate that with experience, with robotic technology, there's really no limitations to what we can do. Anything that we can do open, we can do robotically. Uh, so uh, hopefully that gets you excited about beginning your journey with robotic partial nephrectomy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, you can ask question to Dr. Abaja while they're changing the laptop. Ronnie. I think uh, in my hands there is one indication to clamp uh, the vein, and these are the endophytic ones at the right side, because at the left side usually it O2 compresses, but at the right side sometimes very intrarenal, it could be useful to clamp the vein as well. Uh, do you do the same? Or? I, I rarely clamp the vein. I think you're right that the time that you want to clamp the vein or the time that you most likely will need to clamp the vein is if you're on the right side and you have a hyalur tumor, you're going to be very close to the main renal vein. Uh, in those cases, I'll put a vessel loop on the vein, I'll turn up the pneumoperitoneum to 20, and then I'll just wait and see what happens. If I start cutting into the kidney and there's a lot of bleeding, then I'll clamp the vein, but I rarely have had to do that.